You're coming down to see the earliest spiritual writing when people say the Bible. The point is, is that that's why it says in the King James Version, diligently compared and revised. But revised to what? You have to come all the way to the text and coming forth by day and by night where these spiritual writings were written long before King James, long before the New Americanized Version, long before long before the Septuagint version and all these other various versions. This is where the earliest spiritual writing is at. So we're going to go I have to bend down a little bit and we're going to come up in the chamber of Teddy. Greece didn't exist. They were in caves painting themselves blue. <laughs> Teddy's pyramid of the sixth dynastic period. As I said before, the difference of the old kingdom pyramids that you saw at the Giza Plateau that you're equally going to see in Dajar is that those pyramids have no medunet or no writing. But during the 5th and the 6th dynasty, we see the writing, what is known as the pyramid text. This is where the pyramid text came from. This is the prototype of the earliest religious writing. Without this, Kemet would not have Per and Haru coming forth by day and by night. You would not have a Torah you would not have a Bible, and you would not have a Quran. Mm. This is the origin of the earliest spiritual writing. And in, uh, in, in Unis, you got pyramid texts. These are the oldest texts in ancient Kyrie. They are pyramid texts. Then they moved into the coffin text, and then they went into the papyrus. What we need to highlight in the time left are the people who have enriched our lives with the written word. We can start in 2800 BC, with Ptahhotep, who wrote the oldest known book in the world. By the Middle Kingdom in Kemet, these ancient African people had begun a writing tradition still familiar to us today. A story called The Tale of Two Brothers comes to us. All forms of writing from the epic poem to the novel had been solidified by that time. Jumping forward in time, we see the African tradition of writing continued. Brothers and sisters, here we have holy texts. Holy writings. We've gone into Unus's pyramid. We've gone into Teti's pyramid. Spiritual writing when the Sahu, the spiritual body, astral projected. This is long before biblical text was even in existence. You can't talk about African contributions without talking about African written contributions. We've told you about the 27 known written languages which existed before European contact. Let me just show you Insibidi, Mende, the Moon script from the Cameroons, the Vice script from Liberia, and the Bete script from the Ivory Coast. And it's important to expose students to all these different writing systems because that destroys the myth that African people had no systems of writing, that African people did not write. It's a myth, it's a lie. Here you have the Incivity script, on your right, and then you have the Egyptian script on the left. Look at the similarities. Look at them. Comparison between the Egyptian script and the Toma signs. Look at the similarities. See, when you look at stuff like this, then it becomes very hard for people to tell you that, well, Egypt was isolated. Egypt was not a part of Africa. The Mende signs. This is Vi. The Moon. So I don't know what they keep trying to talk about that Mes Mesopotamia brought anything into Africa. That's bullshit. Ain't nothing out there in, 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 in what you call Iraq but nothing but mud mounds. They ain't got no stone, no papyrus, and if anybody tell you they was writing before the Africans, they telling a damn lie, because paper come from papyrus. If they was writing before the African, tell, ask them what the hell was they writing on. That's all you got to ask. What was you writing on? So we move on, we can see here at the Great Temple of Amun in Karnak, going all the way back in its foundation from the 12th dynastic period, you can see Roman numerals before the Romans. Ryan mathematical papyrus. Here you can see the here you can see the the area of a triangle. 
They're figuring out the area of triangles here in Kemet. And look at the heretic writing here. This is not even this. See, they had three different types of writing. And here you can see the volume of pyramids, the volume of truncated pyramids. And they always telling us how advanced the Mesopotamian mathematics was. They never show you a single example of it. Just tell you that. The Ashago Ball is the world's oldest mathematical artifact. Most people think that the study of mathematics had its origins in ancient Egypt and Babylonia, but this view was dramatically challenged in the 1950s with the discovery of a small animal, bo animal bone inscribed with marking that appeared to represent numbers. It don't appear, they are numbers. The artifact was discovered in a small African fishing village of Ashango on the border of Zaire and Uganda at the beginning of the Nile, which we said the Ashango bone now lies at the Museum of Natural Science in Brussels and has been dated to around 20,000 BC. Alexander Marjak and Jean de Hazelin agree it shows the first evidence of multiplication and math skills in the world. You see the lines? You see, this? You see the carvings? See, it didn't develop. It got carvings on it. And so this is what it developed to. I'll bring it back for you, family. So y'all can see the development. It come out of the interior of Africa. And it come down and now, and this is what you have in Egypt. You got one of them in Babylonia, Mesopotamia? Uh, 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 Maya Aztecs. Then there are such things as the Amos Mathematical Papyrus, also known as the Rhine Papyrus. It lets you know that the ancient Kamites knew about truncated pyramids, quadratures of circles and fractions thousands of years ago, well before computers. They also had the mathematical sophistication to create star clocks, merquettes, and water clocks. Again, it's worth reminding you that Egypt is in Africa. So this mathematical accomplishment came from Africans and African people. Now here we go with the Elvis Pack, 1525-1504 BCE. Edwin Smith Pack, 1600 BCE. And you can see to the right is the Arabic. And you can see where they copied right up out of the Haram. Because they didn't have no damn book. Look at the day, uh, the 8th Dynasty, 1500 BCE. Joshua. Late Egypt, uh, second century. Matthew, Egypt, first half of the fourth century. Leviticus, uh, Egypt, late century. The oldest manuscript of Jonah and First Peter, Egypt, third century. See the arm, see the arm, and the cross. Still on there, still on there, family. There it is. I blew it up for you so you can see it. That's the that's the Gospel of Judas. Go look it up. But did this show you right there? There was right on papyrus. That come about the Nile Valley. These are the oldest parts of the goddamn Bible. This is third century in Egypt. We developed paper because we was pushing the technology of language. Language is a technology. And we were developing all kinds of languages. We already got the research to show that we are the authors of writing. We invented papyrus. I ask anybody, if you invented writing, what the hell did you write it on? Because we invented paper coming from papyrus, which is an indigenous African plant. You can go right to the damn internet and type in papyrus, and it's going to tell you an indigenous plant from uh, Egypt, the Nile Valley. And he's going to show me some clay cookies that are descended of an Arab and wrote a little clay cookie. I'm going to show you this shit. And he's going to say that this man is the author of right. Now, this is the Mesopotamians, right? No claim. They said, look at that shit. What the hell do that say? Nobody know. At least with the hieroglyphs, you can see some zoo types. You can see different things that really exist. Arms, people. What the hell is that? This is the ziggurat of Earth. This is, now, when you look at this, you say, okay, maybe they did have a little knowledge. But they dressed this down. Building up. This is what the damn building looked like before, right now, in this millennium, they went over that little mud castle and put those bricks around there to give you the illusion that that's how it looked. But it could never compare to what you're looking at right here. The great pyramids of Giza that the Nile Valley Africans put down. Ain't no damn debate. Here it is, right there in your face. And they're going to tell you that another civilization on, on the same level of Kemet existed in America. Nigga, show us the damn pyramid. Show us the architecture, the artifacts, and the writings. 
They can't show you nothing. Here again shows you the architecture of Mesopotamia. They only built with mud brick. If you're the cream of the planet Earth, you got to show me something better than this. Jesse, Jerusalem Muslim, Father Kabbalah, another weak ass scholar. But the Ashango bone, evidence of prime number, 25,000 BCE, 2650 step pyramid constructed, use of, of early use of integral calculus. We dropping calculus. We dropping, dropping trigonometry. We dropping geometry. We dropping astronomy. We dropping mathematics. What do you have in Asia that can stand up to this, this evidence, this hard evidence in fact? They had already developed that knowledge many thousand year, of years before dynastic Egypt. You got to understand that dynastic, dynastic Egypt, Egypt began around 4100 BCE but Egypt was already there. It, ju it just not. It just didn't form into the nation yet. It was just small counties. They were well advanced. They many of them had writing. They already had the knowledge of government. They already had the knowledge of divine kingship. They all already had uh, deities, what you call gods, and many of these uh, different areas of Africa. And this is the first documented goddamn nation on the planet outside of Nubia, which is right up the river from Egypt. When it comes to the eye alone, it will tell you where the greatest minds on this planet have existed. It is in the Nile Valley. And so when we talk about mathematics, it is in Africa where the documentation, where the evidence is so heavy, we're not regurgitating mathematics. We're showing where our people dropped it down so fucking hard, nigga, that you can only wonder how they did it. You understand what I'm saying? When we look at the pyramids, we are looking at the greatest accomplishment ever built by mathematics. And we're not regurgitating. And they are lying. The Giza Plateau with the three stars in Orion's belt. So the astronomy is also mathematics. The first calendar appeared, first solar 365 day calendar, and they were not regurgitating it because it's still carved in the wall. See that square? Uh oh. Huh? But they was actually squaring some stone with that. You know, some motherfucker talking about they own the square. Get the, get the hell out of here, nigga, just talking. You're speculating. You're a speculative mason. You're not operating. You ain't building shit. But we got to go back. You understand? It ain't just to, you know, for motherfuckers to put symbols on the back of their car and boats like they better than nobody. Learn how to actually square some stone with that, man. So we can construct some houses for our sake. Okay? You see, men, this is a form of Amen, the god of fertility. You see the squares? You see the 90 degrees? Yes, sir. Can you see them? Yes, sir. Do you see it? There are one right there. You see that one? Okay. I mean, you see the other one? See the flail? That's on the ninth. Right there. Okay? Now what you do, if you take this one right here and turn it right side up, you got it like this. Okay? If you take this one and just bring it on over, you got that. What it look like? Bingo. What it look like? Bingo. What's up, Mason? Well, yeah, I've seen somebody flee up out of here. That's what it is. That's what it is. There it is. And you see it there, it's all over camp. Now, don't, don't, don't get out of the control, because you see a black man's fouls. This is sacred teachings right here. But he was just on the dead level. Now you see him being raised up to the living perpendicular. Uh-oh. See that right angle? See that square? See that 90 degree? I put it in there so you can see. So I don't want nobody to say, and this right here, a saw go back pre-dynastic, before Kemet. All the deities that you see in Kemet were brought to Kemet from about Anubia. There it is. You see the flail? It's on an acute. There it is. Now, if you take this one, and you turn it right side up and take this one and put it on top of it, I'm going to show you what it looks like. 
That's what it looked like. Huh? Let me bring it to you so you can see. Can you see it? What, the, what secret he got? He ain't got no damn secret. The secret is he ain't got no secret. That's the secret. Take a look at it. There it is. Just to show you again. Raised up on the square. 90 degrees. You understand what I'm saying? All of that symbolism, all those mathematics, they got up out the Nile God. Hey, see the, see the rulers? That's mathematics. Okay? And so here's, this is a better look at it. You understand what I'm saying? So very well, it might, it could have been a ruler, it could have been a calendar. Either or. But those notches represent either a day or it represent a, 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 a mathematical point. From an inch, a half an inch, but that's what it represents. And here again, you see the comedic rule. Now, coming up out of this book, Dr. Ben tells us that uh, at 10,000 uh, to 6,000 BCE, the stellar calendar is in use by the ancient Nile Valley Africans and other Africans of the Great Lakes region. I want y'all to look at them dates. You understand what I'm saying? 4,000 solar calendar in use by the ancient Nile Valley Africans. The book of the coming forth by day and by night was introduced in a re revised state, also known today as the book of the day. Now, this right here is the solar calendar that's on the Egyptian wall. So if anybody ever, you know, want to, you know, say, show us the damn calendar, you can see the calendar. Right here is the sun, here's the sun, and next to it, if you see this right here, this is represent, representative of 10. So you got 10, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. That's day 26. 27, 28, 29, and this is symbolic of 30 days. The Egyptian had uh, 12 30-day months with a special five-day month added at the end, a special month of five days that needed to be added to bring it to the true 365-day uh, calendar. You got 12 30-day months that brings it to what? 360, okay? And they added a special five-day month at the end of the, uh, after the, uh, the 12, 30 day months, which makes the extra five day to bring it to a true 365 day calendar. Those five days were sacred to the birth of Asa, Aset, Neptus, Nephet, Set, and Heru or Horus the Elder. That's what the five days is representative of. So you look over here, you see the sun, so the same calendar. The calendar that you are on today come out of Egypt. It didn't come out of Arabia, huh? It didn't come out of Israel or the Vatican City or Mecca, okay? This is where it was located. In Egypt, the, three, the, fir the first time a 365-day calendar appeared on the planet Earth. This is accredited to your ancestors. You need to go back and fetch. As you can see, the different, uh, the different days, right there is five, right here you got six, right here you got seven, right here you got eight. Let's move on. The first concept of triangulation. Triangulation? Was that a tribute to Pythagoras? You don't answer all these questions here in a minute. As you see geometry, geometry means the measure of land. Ain't no Greeks measuring no land over there in those mountains up there on Mount Olympus. This is where Earth measurement starts here. Pythagoras studied for 22 years and came and read Plutarch on Osiris and Isis. The Egyptians measured everything. We were obsessed with measurement and mathematics. You can see here the brothers measuring the gold. Now white folks measuring the gold. Measured everything. Even the soul, the heart, was weighed on the scale, on the balance. You had to come before Tehuti thought, and your heart had to be just and true. They weighed everything. Everything was dealing with mathematics and science. Here you can see the area of a circle. I mean, you knew that they were involved in the area, area of mathematics. I, I mean, you knew that. 
the area of a circle. Look at the, the Ryan Mathematical Papyrus here. The area of the circle. The area of a square. Ryan Mathematical Papyrus. We move on. And then after they figured out the area of the triangles, they built triangles. Right there, and then they tell us Pythagoras was the father of the law of triangulation, which they called and named it after him, Pythagorean Theorem. We got triangles sitting right there. The biggest triangle you ever saw. They can't see it. We move on. And here you can see the volume of pyramids. The volume of truncated pyramids. Here they are, square numbers. Square numbers. Now what's the basis for Pythagorean's, Pythagoras' theorem? Is it square roots? Is it square numbers? Here's the basis of it. The squaring of numbers. This is the Berlin papyrus here, the Moscow papyrus, rather. So don't tell me, don't say Brother Mathieu is making this stuff up, that Brother Mathieu can't subject his passion to reason. As you can see, Pythagoras coming into Kemet, we studied for 20, he said it himself. He studied for 22 years in Kemet. Then he went and studied 16 years in Mesopotamia and went back to Greece and started a school of mathematics. Then they said he was the father of the theorem. Just like they said Hippocrates was the father of medicine, you saw him hotel, they made him the god of medicine. And the only first thing you hear of Hippocrates, he's in Egypt studying medicine. See, see the triangles? Long before Pythagoras. You okay? So don't, don't come in here with that. You need to, so you can go look that up, our most papyrus, and look it up and teach it to your babies. Long before some goddamn Pythagoras, Pythagoras, when his story opened, he opened up, he ain't Kimmy. Just like Dr. Ben said, you never heard of none of the philosophers until they was coming home from Kimmy. You never heard of their ass before they went. You never heard of them before they went. Thales, uh, Plato, all them thieves. I done busted that wide open. I done busted it because there ain't no semantic. What is an era? A mixed breed. That's all it is. So here you got Shem for all the semantics. 2441 BCE, I'm giving you dates. Ham, 2440 BCE. You got Kush up there, 2342 BCE. Do you see the pyramids right there? That's at 2550 BCE. Do you know it took two, three hundred thousand years of architectural development to even get to that damn date right there? Do you understand what I'm saying? So how in the hell is you gonna go back and tell me something about a damn Semite that's born 2441 BCE. Nigga, be me. Just be me. There's nothing we can do with that. I'm sorry. That's garbage. Can't start no damn history with that family. We much older than that. We hundreds of thousands of years older than that. With facts. So here we have the Egyptian hieroglyphic of Medunetta writing, which is the parent of the Sinai inscription. The Sinai inscription is the parent of the Phoenician script. The Phoenician script was the parent of the early Greek script. Obviously, the Greek script is the parent of the Roman script, which is the script that we use today throughout the Western civilization. Why did they teach us this in school? Maybe I would have been a better writer if I knew that the letter that I was writing with was a letter that I had invented. They didn't teach us this. So here you find that the Phoenicians are beholden to the Sinaitic, and the Sinaitic are beholden to the Egyptians, and we know from the latest discoveries in Tarsetti and Kusto that the script preceded the Egyptians by several generations in Nubia, then the Egyptians themselves are beholden to the land of Punt, to the God's land. This is important that we make these kinds of parallels. Let's look at the lies that they're telling. If, it's, if he's dealing with Semitic, the language Semitic, what he's doing, it comes from Shem. If there is no Shem, then there is no Semitic. That's what y'all got to understand. Those are fictional characters. We Africans, we ain't no damn Semitics. We've been here longer than that. So here is the, uh, this is the Holy Bible. A good brother who was in Africa brought this back. He brought, this was in um, Ghana. This was a missionary's Bible. And it had a dick, uh, encyclopedia inside of it explaining a lot of the Bible. And so this shows you a, a series of plates illustrating biblical versions and and antiquities helps to the study of the Bible will help validate that the Semites didn't have a language until their contact with Kim. Okay, I'm giving you the copyright day 1896. This is what it says. 
the original, the principal language through which the Holy Scriptures have been transmitted to us are Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It is therefore of interest to know the origin of the alphabets in which those tongues were written and the history of their development. The identification of their common origin is of quite recent date. It was not difficult to connect the Greek alphabet with the alphabet which is usually called Phoenician, but which is to perhaps better to give the wider name of Semitic. The forms of letters and still more their names and order conclusively prove the relationship. But to pr prove the descent of the Semitic alphabet from the Egyptian was a long and difficult task. In our shape, the Semitic letters are to all appearance quite different from the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Their names are different, their order is different. These difficulties cause scholars to reject the ancient tradition handed down by the Greeks and Roman writers that the Semites had originally obtained their letters from Egypt. The tradition has, however, proved correct. In 1859, the French Egyptologist Desroges published the results of his study of an ancient cursive form of Egyptian writing, a form to which the name of Horatic, or writing of the, of the priest, has been given, and showed beyond reasonable doubt that it was the connecting link between the Egyptian and Semitic alphabets. The most important document of which he made use of was the Prissy Papyrus, the date of which is conjectured to be around 2500 BCE. Let me go down here. The Semitics adopted two and twenty of the Egyptian, twenty-two of the Egyptian alphabetical signs, and there can be little doubt that this formation of a new alphabet took place during the period of the Semitic conquest and occupation of the Delta, the Hitchcocks. That's what it's saying. They knew that in 1859. We got your ways. We got your ways. About 4,500 BC, ancient Egyptians began using burial texts to accompany the dead. First known written documents. Now this is deep. Now we know, we know by 4,500 BC they're doing this. That meant they had to be at least four or 5,000 years getting to that. Because you don't just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to write. We know we invented writing, and they know it. And if you read in the Phaedrus by Plato, in Phaedrus, he says that the Africans gave the world. He's calling us Ethiopians, which is a Greek word for burnt things. He said the Africans give the world, and he names Jews, and he says mathematics, and he says he names a number of the other things, all of the sciences, geometry, etc. He says that the greatest science of all that they've given to the world is the science of writing itself. Now they've got this in their archive from their main man. And they're still running around, running some Hammurabi stuff down. Running some Greek stuff down. You understand? And this is their main man telling them. So the white folks try to play around Ethiopia with this Semitic thing and Hermetic thing. Our diaspora is the final chapter. The ancestral lineage built pyramids. America's first immigrant, the king's son and daughters from now waters. The first architect, the first philosophers, astronomers, the first prophets and the doctors was us. Hey. Now here we go with the Elvis Papyrus. 1525-1504 BCE. Now, if you look right there to the left, you see the writings. When you see the red, that's just like the Bible. When they say Jesus' writings are in his speech, the things that he spoke is in red, that's where they got that from. And you can see to the right is the Arabic. And you can see where they copied right up out of the Horatic. Just like the white boy had already done the research and showed you. Because they didn't have no damn book into the Quran. Give a damn what they say. They're liars. They did not have manuscripts. And you know a manuscript because a manuscript is written on paper. Our most papyrus, 1650 BCE. We dealing with high science here, fam. And you can see where the Hebrews and the Arabs got their language from. And when you go into the Bible and you see where the words of Jesus is in red. Yes, sir. Please, God. Huh? We, we, we know where you're stealing this shit from. Huh? The Quran got red writing in red. But don't get confused. Because Arabic is our language. 
There is no Arabic race. The word Arab connotes people who live in the sand, in the desert. It, it's not a connotation to race. It's a connotation to ecological location. They have turned it into a connotation to race. But the only place you can find a reference or roots to the Arabic language is to look at Medunetta. Right? That's hieroglyph, right? The, right? the drawing language, the picture language. That language was put together by the African elite for the illiterate African masses so that they could comprehend the same thing that the elite could comprehend without having formal education. By using symbols from the ecology to express concepts, ideas, and principles, you didn't have to go to college to know what the elite was talking about. This language out of which Hebrew flow is the technical language and the scientific language of Medunetta, which is referred to as the Herodic script. Okay. And then there is this one, the Demotic script, which is Arabic. Alif ba ta ta jim ha ka dal dal ra za sim sim sa da. All of them are contained, plus many more symbols than they use in the language that they call the Demotic script, which is really the Murotic script of Sudan, which precedes this script. You understand what I'm saying? If we don't grab and get an understanding of how they've been playing, playing with us, and playing us this language. You will not find this anywhere else in the world before you find this cursive form of writing in the Sudan. It is the Sudan that the ancients used to call Ethiopia. Ancient Egyptian is a member of, of Afro-Asiatic, a language family whose members are primarily in Africa and according to most linguists who actually study Afro-Asiatic primarily, otherwise called Afrosan or Afrasian, it originated in Africa. What is the evidence for this? Linguists use uh, two primary principles to locate the origins of a ling language family or a phylum. The greatest diversity principle and also uh, another principle called uh, the least moves principle. The greatest diversity uh, principle basically says that wherever you find the greatest number of members of a language family or of plants or what have you is most likely with few exceptions to be its place of origin. In the case of Afro-Asiatic five or six of the the members depending on how many members you believe are in the family are found in Africa and Africa alone. The sixth member or rather the sixth or seventh member is found in the Near East, namely the Semitic family. Uh, and it actually returned to Africa on two separate or three separate occasions. Uh, one time with the Phoenicians, uh, another time in the Horn of Africa, and also uh, much later on in the Islamic period with the uh, uh, emergence of, uh, of Islam in North Africa with the coming of people from the Arabian Peninsula. The other thing about uh, historical linguistics too in terms of the anchoring of the Afro-Asiatic family is that the most undifferentiated members or the members that seem to be sort of the oldest or the, the, the most archaic are very much confined to places in East Africa, specifically in the Horn. So this is another clue that uh, the origin of the family is in Africa. Here we have the, a language map of Africa. Uh, language is also a, a part of culture. It's part of this origins questions. The uh, the top part of the map represent the Afro-Asiatic language family. This is not all of the, uh, uh, the families now. There's some new families and, s and some new members of the family. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, Omotic, which is spoken only in southern Ethiopia, down in here. And uh, there's another language. It's a dead language called Ongata spoken only by less than 10 people now, which is also felt to be a member of Afro-Asiatic. All right. Uh, this obviously doesn't have ancient Egyptian on it because the reason we have Semitic in North Africa across what I call super-Saharan Africa is because of uh, during the Islamic period, Arabic was adopted by people 
And in some cases, you had uh, groups of Arabs who actually came into North Africa, such as the Halalian invasion in the, uh, the uh, 11th century, no, in the, in the 12th century. Nubian Nilo-Saharan. In the Sahara, we have both Afro-Asiatic and Nilo-Saharan languages. And in the Sudan today, we have both languages spoken as well. This is one notion of how these languages may be connected genealogically. This is Roger Blench, who actually lives right here in Cambridge. Uh, this is a tree that he published. Uh, in this, he has Semitic languages spoken in the Near East, splitting off early. He suggested there may be an Erythraic group that Egyptian Berber Chadic spoken around uh, Lake Chad and, and northern Nigeria, but also in other parts of the Sahara. Beja spoken in the Sudan and Egypt even today, and Cushitic languages. And uh, often, here you have a picture from the great Russian linguist uh, Diakonov, Igor Diakonov, who died a few years ago. This is from his book, uh, uh, Afrasian Languages, published in 1965. Uh, he has the family of Afro-Asiatic originating uh, near the Horn of Africa, either in the Southern Sahara, the Sudan, or uh, some people say in Ethiopia proper. Uh, he has a Semitic branch going in across the Red Sea into Arabia. Other people have it going in through the north. Now, uh, uh, this is a, is a way to conceptualize the cradle land of the family and the fact that its daughters emerge out of a, a group of what's called dialect clusters that would have been there. Although there is one linguist who does think that Semitic actually, actually emerged in the horn, Grover Hudson, but he does believe that uh, based on uh, the, the age of, or the amount of diversity in the Semitic languages in the Horn of Africa. Family of Afro-Asiatic originating uh, near the Horn of Africa, either in the Southern Sahara, the Sudan, or uh, some people say in Ethiopia proper. Uh, he has a Semitic branch going in across the Red Sea into Arabia. Other people have it going in through the north.